Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 189, recorded Monday, February 23rd, 2015. Gregor Freund. Triangulation is brought to you by Ring Central, the business phone system that's in the cloud. Ring Central now integrates with Google for work. Try Ring Central with a 30 day risk free trial. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800 543 9980 and use the promo code TWIT. And by lynda.com. Invest in yourself and start learning today. Lynda.com has thousands of courses to help you learn new tech, business, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash triangulation. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash triangulation. And by FreshBooks, the easy-to-use invoicing software designed to help small business owners save time billing and get paid faster. Join over 5 million users running their business with ease. Try it free at freshbooks.com slash triangulation. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we interview some of the most interesting people in technology, and we get you to help us out in the chat room near the third leg of the triangle. Our great, our guest today is, uh, you know, it's funny, an old friend. Uh, Gregor Freund uh, has was on the Screensavers many years ago mm -hmm. when he was uh, the founder of Zone Labs, mm -hmm. the creators of Zone Alarm, the first mass market firewall product. The first one that worked, yeah. That worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got a new startup, Versal. Well, is it Versal? Is that how you pronounce Versal, it? Versal, yes. Yeah, we'll talk about Versal in just a little bit. But I want to start. Anyway, welcome, Gregor. It's Thank you. To have you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming all the way up here. Um, I want to start uh, back in Germany. You told us to, you could fix this radio, by the way. And I, I will. I'm, and you have a screwdriver in your back pocket. I so have a screwdriver in the back pocket. We probably can get you a soldering yeah. iron if you need one. <laughs> you used to fix these as a kid? I used to collect those because in Germany they have this thing of unwieldy garbage collection once a month. There's so a name for it. What's it? Sperrmüll. Sperrmüll. Yeah. And so they put everything that's unwieldy from washing machines to beds to mattresses, stuff like that out and there's a big truck coming and collecting them and we kind of like went ahead of the truck and picked up the things we actually interested in, a couple of kids. And so I ended up with a whole collection of these radios, learned how to fix them, wow. put, in, put in new tubes and all of that stuff. And so, I'm, I've, I mean, this is really a blast from the past. <laughs> it, the, I, they were old even then. So, oh, yeah. So that oh, yeah. people were throwing them out because nobody, nobody wanted them anymore. But yeah. they still have the warmest, best sound because they have tubes. They have tubes and uh, they're just beautiful instruments. Do you still have any? I don't have any, no, but I might take this one home. You could take this one with you. I'm okay. sure it's not repairable. It's we'll have everything, to look is, everything is repairable. I, th I think there's a turntable. There's a turntable yeah. in there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so well, you can play your records and listen to the radio. Right. With these big old. That's probably Bakelite, right? That's probably that's not even plastic. It's, it's, no, it's Bakelite and it's. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it's all analog. Is that where you got your training in, uh, in electronics? Is uh, that's that kind of all thing? the training I've ever gotten, yeah. yeah. I dropped out of high school when I was 17. No kidding. Yeah, I never went to college. The but first time I saw college from the inside uh, was when I uh, did a lecture at Stanford for an MBA. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I have... First time was, I've been in one of these. Yeah. yeah. But uh, you were a journalist first. I, well, first before. It, was, it was a long story. I... I uh, was friends with a guy who ran, uh, who, who was a publisher of a computer magazine called Micro in Germany. And their whole staff ran away basically without notice to start a Unix magazine. Nice. <laughs> uh, they were like 15 years too early, but nevertheless. Yeah. And so he said, hey, Gregor, please, 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 can you help us out? And there was nothing. I mean, basically, a, a monthly magazine, like 200 pages with absolutely no articles. <laughs> and so we had to kind of produce that. Holy and we cow. had two weeks. And, Prior to that, I had exposure. I had Byte magazine in Germany. There was yeah. big ads. Yep. There was an ad for a product called Turbo Pascal, which I knew Pascal a little bit. And so, because I knew the product, I wrote a long review on Turbo Pascal. And to fill two more pages, I called up this company, Borland, which had at that point like 10 people, a guy called Philipp Kahn, which is now a very, very good friend of mine. And uh, 
So we talked about, hey, listen, what are you going to do? How are you going to distribute it in Germany? And he said, well, we're talking to these guys and that guys and said, don't do anything stupid. I have to get the magazine out. And two weeks later, I was sitting. At, you flew to Scotts Valley. Fl flew to Scotts Valley, was uh, sitting there with Philippe and Dennis in Scotts Valley. And so we talked about it. And he said, hey, listen, give it a try. So I flew home with a suitcase full of Turbo Pascal. Wow. And so we started, we started Ball in Germany. That, what year was that? Oh, too long ago. <laughs> I really. 80, I want to say. Yeah, it must be something around that. Yeah. Well, certainly the 80s. Yeah. Uh, and, and this wasn't, we weren't talking Windows here. We were talking about CPM at the time. CPM. Point. Yeah, and MS DOS. So MS DOS on CPM, mm -hmm. or, or, or C, MSS and CPM. Yeah, it was actually the, that was a year where the uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft and IBM introduced the PC. So that was 81. That was 81. And uh, that's where I first encountered uh, Turbo Pascal. Yeah. That, and that and, was really, they were a year in at that point. Yeah. I mean, it was brand new. Mm -hmm. And you remember, this is the machine which started with 64 kilobytes of memory. Mm -hmm. Didn't even have a floppy yeah. disk in the, in the base yeah. uh, model. You're supposed to pull stuff in mm -hmm. off cassette, uh, cassette port. Yeah. These are very primitive, running on an 8088 8-bit uh, processor. Mm -hmm. And yet Turbo Pascal was amazing. I mean, we, I remember using an old C compiler called the Whitehead C mm -hmm. compiler. It was very slow. You'd yeah. write your code... And then you go get a cup of coffee. Then you have to churn. link it. And then you have to. It, it's right. It would compile, and then you yeah, had to run was, another step. Yeah. It was it was painful. And then if anything was wrong, it would give you a very cryptic one line that something went wrong. It wouldn't give you a location. It wouldn't give you anything. It would just like basically tell you, "Hey, listen, you messed up." But I have to say, we were happy because mm -hmm. this was a group of people who'd come from punch cards right. and flipping switches. So yeah. it was still uh, light years yeah. ahead of this. Mm -hmm. But Turbo Pascal, first of all, no linking. There was no linking. It was an integrated. It was the first integrated development environment. It had it an showed, editor and a debugger. It showed debugger. exactly where the, where where your errors were. It wow. it was lightning fast. It was you pressed the button and it was it was an amazing amazing product. And so we actually gotten the rights. It was an independent company, but it was called Ball in Germany, and we gotten the rights to distribute it in Germany all on a verbal agreement. Wow. I mean, Philippe says, "Hey, try it." People, and, I, you know, Philippe's still around. In fact. Yeah. He, his company, he was the guy who invented camera phone I know. photography. I know you know. I'm telling, mm -hmm. obviously yeah. you would know this. <laughs> but I think people don't know that we, we would have no camera phone photography mm -hmm. if Philippe hadn't wanted to send a picture of his newborn exactly. to the world and said, you know, this isn't right. I should, ha I should be able to do this. Yeah. And invented the software, which is now MotionX, right? Which yeah. is in everything. Yeah. It's well, they, they have, I, I mean, I, I probably let Philippe talk for his own company, uh, but uh, yeah, they invented really the Internet of Things in many ways yeah. and but he invented was, sensors. He was such a character in, those, in the days that mm -hmm. you knew him, and I'm sure he still yeah. is, bigger than life. Mm -hmm. And I think people have kind of forgotten him in this era. Which is, I don't think they've forgotten him, but I think we've really He's forgotten history. where a lot of these things came from. Yeah. And uh, he also, there's... there's meta values that he invented. For example, that res uh, software has to be incredibly responsive, that if you click something, something has to happen, you can't just wait, and so on. Right. And he was preaching that to us. And, and anyway, so we, we, started, we started selling Turbo Pascal in Germany, and then when uh, Boland went public, uh, in the UK actually first, they bought Boland Germany and Boland Italy, oh. and uh, basically oh, bought nice. us out. And I moved to the US and started, uh, started development there, and then when Philippe left Borland and started Starfish, I was the first developer. Starfish, I yeah. loved Starfish. Yeah. That was like a yeah. uh, calendar and uh, address, yeah. everything. And right. they invented the PDA. Right. So they invented, invented the really. Yeah. They invented really. I, I remember we were sitting there. It was this little card that actually had a touch interface. First time that anybody did a touch interface, and uh, we didn't have time to uh, to build the icons and all the graphics and stuff like that. So we stole all the icons from AOL Messenger <laughs> and repurposed them, Oops. made them black and white. Oh. <laughs> uh, but it's, 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 it's an incredible unit. Yeah. And we were working, uh, Philippe had a house in Scotts Valley at that time, and he had this, uh, the previous owner of the house was a guitar player who uh, uh, had a big, big studio. And, and Philippe, of course, is a saxophone yeah, player. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so we we were sitting in the studio and programming uh, and building and playing and, playing and oh, wow. uh, well I'm not I don't play I mean you don't want to hear me but uh, Philippe did Philippe released yeah, an album yeah, I remember yeah yeah and and <laughs> built basically built what's now the mobile revolution amazing why Pascal 
Because it's a really good training language. It's something that really, it's a very, very good structured uh, language. It was written it to was, teach, right? It was written originally to teach, and then we really expanded it into yeah. something that you actually can do production uh, uh, code quite well. And it was Nicholas Witt at, uh, in Zurich who, who invented the language. And he just said, hey, listen, it has to be simple. It has to be structured. It has to be strong types. And then uh, we put in all the object-oriented stuff in there, so it became an object-oriented language. And, of course, three years later, Apple mm. comes out, and everything in Apple and for the Mac is written in Pascal. They, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. they, they were just millions of people. That was, for many, many people when in the CPM days, that was two products that they could have. One was Turbo Pascal, and the other one was WordStar. Right. And we actually built a machine in Germany because all the machines had different formats on the floppy disks. So people could send us the floppy disk. We build an analyzer that would kind of <laughs> check what the format is and then copy Turbo Pascal on that. So all the early adapters started programming in Turbo Pascal. In Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It, I think, yeah, it's hard to imagine the impact Turbo Pascal uh, had. It revolutionized everything we yeah. now take for granted about development. It, really, that's a starting point. And it was written by a kid. It was kid, written by a 17-year-old kid, the core of it, a guy called Anders Halsberg. He written it in an assembler. Who is a legend now. He, who is now, he, yeah, he invented C Sharp, he's not Microsoft right now. But what Philippe added to that is, I mean, that would have been just a compiler. Right. But he, Philippe really added to that is the whole idea that it has to be convenient, that you just don't have command lines, but you have an integrated environment right. where you can do everything. It really made programming accessible to everybody else. Uh, and I used it like crazy, and it's, mm -hmm. hard, to, it's hard to imagine. I mean, it w the, the revelation it was to use that the first time <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> like, oh, done, it's world, like... Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Wait a minute, I didn't have a chance to get yeah. a cup of coffee. And, and that was really just years after the punch cards. I mean, I it know. was kind of like, uh, it went really, really quickly. Yeah, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. And you're still involved, and I want to talk about Zone Labs, and Steve Gibson is mm -hmm. in the uh, chat room, yeah. uh, because Steve Gibson is who introduced us to you and mm -hmm. to Zone Alarm, yeah. and we're going to get to that uh, in just a second. Mm -hmm. But first, a word about our phone system. Now, that sounds pretty dull compared to what we've just talked about. <laughs> but it isn't. If you are in business, you need a phone system. This was a revelation to me when we built the studios. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, I can't let my staff just keep using their cell phone. No. You have to put a phone on the desks. You have to have a phone line in the conference room. You have to have a polycom. Con so well, what am I going to do? Thank goodness, Russell. Oh, Russell Tammany, I still owe you. We're not worthy. He is our, still is our IT guy, our consulting IT guy. And he said, well, I've installed this thing, Ring Central. This was long before they were a sponsor. I've installed this thing, Ring Central, uh, for other customers. They love it. Uh, and, I, you know, let's try it. And I said, well, wait a minute. Do I, I don't want a PBX. No, no, no PBX. I don't want to deal with a phone company. No, no, you're not. It's all in the cloud. It's, it's all virtualized, and it's amazing. Ring Central gives you much more than you can get with a landline phone system because it is cloud-based. Voice, fax, uh, you could text. You could text from your cell phone using the business number you can make calls from your cell phone using the business number because they have you can use your cell phone still but you use the app and then and then we pay for it right the, the business pays for it you get conference calling you get high def video meetings now they keep adding features to ring center in fact they just added ring center for google now you can integrate google for work which we use here like religiously right into ring central that means for instance you can be in gmail you not only hear your voicemails but click a number in an email It'll dial on Ring Central or contacts or calendar. It'll dial just like on your smartphone. You can uh, be in your Gmail account, get a dial pad. You can. You don't have to leave Google Apps. Plus, many other features. You fax from Google Drive, for instance, which is really awesome. My print, my Epson printer scans to Google Drive, and then I use Ring Central to send the fax out. I don't have to touch a piece of paper. Viewing text messages, scheduling conference calls, all of this can be done right from Google thanks to Ring Central. And here's something nowadays I think everybody cares a lot about. All your calls are encrypted with Ring Central, totally private. They use Secure Voice, a well known, established, reliable security system, which means you don't have to worry about snooping. You can customize your system from a web browser or their mobile apps. Customer support is free at 24 7. And, and boy, we love this no setup fee, no activation fees, uh, under $25 a month per user. And right now, we've got it for free for 30 days. 30-day risk-free trial and a special offer just because you're watching the show. For, for every desk phone you buy, you'll get a second phone free up to a total of 20 phones. For every desk phone you buy and use with Ring Central, you get a second one free up to 20 phones. Get your whole office set up. 
ringcentral.com or call 800-543-9980 and use the promo code TWIT. We love Ring Central. You will too. Ringcentral.com or call 800-543-9980. Our guest is Gregor Freund. I'm saying that right? Yep. It means friend. That's a nice name to have. Uh, it's not my fault. I have <laughs> nothing to do with that. A friendly guy. Yeah. Um, how did you get to uh, Zone Alarm and Zone Labs? How did that happen? Well, it really started out uh, working at Starfish. One of the projects we had is, at that time, internet access and dial-up access was still monitored. So we built a little component uh, called an internet monitor that actually checks how long you're online and how much uh, data you transfer because that was because you'd you be were, billed you were that. built for that and uh, frankly you wanted to know yeah and so i wrote the whole core behind that and got a lot of exposure to the inner workings of windows how tcp ip works how the data gets transferred and so on this is before windows shipped with a tcp ip stack right no it had it still it had, it, one. It had a tcp we were using so, windsock so or that, something. That, that was already windows 95 oh okay uh, so they had windsock and all of these things but there was really no good interface to do that so we had to understand windsock we had to understand all the kernel components behind that and one of the things is i i had one of the first dsl lines in san francisco i lived in san francisco still lived in san francisco and the office was uh, down in scotts valley so i basically telecommuted part of the time and I just hooked up our internet monitor to my DSL line and I was just completely blown away how many attacks there were. And at that time, Windows was incredibly insecure. As right. a matter of fact, Steve Gibson uh, uh, pointed out that you essentially can uh, uh, link to any Windows computer. You can see their file shares. And see their file shares. NetBIOS, file shares was all, uh, port 139, yeah, yeah. wide open. Mm -hmm. And, and one, of the, one of the core things that we, that we saw was that Windows almost too faithfully implemented TCP IP in a sense that they, uh, when, you, when you at that time knocked on the door of a Windows computer, the Windows computer would answer, I'm not here or I'm not talking to you. <laughs> what it really Go means away. is there is a computer. Because I am here. I am here and hey, these are the five things you can try out. This is what Steve Gibson mm -hmm. uh, with Shields Up coined yeah, stealth. Exactly. exactly. And, so, uh, mm -hmm. and people mocked him mm -hmm. for that. And it turned out that it was an incredible discovery because it means once you know a computer's at a given address... You can hammer you it. You can hammer it, you can find out what, what, uh, what ways are there to break in and so on. And so one of the functions that uh, the product that I was working on, Zone Alarm, had was it would actually recreate stealth. So it would just block all of these attempts of Windows to say, I don't want to talk to you, and would just say, you would knock on the door and nobody would answer. Now, and so you don't even know there's an address. The concept of a firewall wasn't mm. new. There were hardware firewalls, weren't there by then? Yeah, but they're very, very hard to program. So you had to block specific ports. You have to understand the whole protocol. And the philosophy of the security at that time was that you build a big wall around the enterprise. Mm -hmm. And everything on the inside is trusted. Anything mm -hmm. on the outside, it kind of gets blocked by the firewall. But we started to see laptops, and people would carry their laptops at mm -hmm. home, get them infected, then walk mm -hmm. to work, and then basically carry these infections into work. Happened at CNN not so long ago. Happened, it happens everywhere. Oh, yeah. And the sad thing is that the same issues that we fought with and actually, to a fairly large extent, fixed are still issues that plagued uh, the industry. It hasn't changed. It has Nothing has changed in terms of security, except that... Now the attackers have become a lot more sophisticated. And when we started Zone Alarm, the, or Zone Labs, the biggest concerns were essentially kids who wanted to brag, who wanted to show how smart they are, and basically hacking for reputation. Right. Very, very quickly that sh shifted into hacking for money. And once you start hacking for money, you're not loud anymore. You don't uh, No, I remember the exploit. first viruses would say, ha ha, uh, yeah. got you, I'm erasing your drive, yeah. and things like that. They would announce themselves because they wanted attention. There was one well-known called Melissa that infected Melissa. probably half of all Windows PCs in the world. The first email virus. Yeah. yeah. And, and they, could have, they could have easily wiped out the Internet for all practical purposes, <laughs> but they didn't have... A, a bad payload, and they didn't spy on anybody. They were terrible all, programmers. All they were, all they were saying is, "Hey, listen, Look, I'm, I I'm here. It. I can do this." Uh, <laughs> Thank God, it was some kid in the Philippines, as yeah, I remember. I yeah, and and so we, we blocked that successfully. And one of the things that we uh, that we were arguing about, and actually ultimately turned out to be right, 
was that the only defense he had at that time was antivirus. Well, antivirus works really well for known patterns and known things because they look for specific patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have seen that virus. I've seen that pattern on your machine. So you, uh, and by the way, usually you find out after you're infected. Yeah, and definitely <laughs> find out after you're infected, at which point it's already too late anyways. Right. I mean, right. your, your data Thanks. is stolen. Quarantine it, great, okay. But then we started to see viruses that were actually custom built for specific attacks. Mm -hmm. So they were going after specific companies for specific purposes. And the antivirus software was just saying, I've never seen this before, I'm, I'm, I don't care about that. Well, we had a completely different approach. What we said is no application on the computer should communicate to the outside without actually us verifying that this is a benign application or that the user at least knows about it. This was a big deal, and I remember this is one of the things Steve was so excited about with Zone Alarm, was it monitored outbound as well as exactly. inbound traffic. There were firewalls. In fact, Windows Firewall traditionally would block inbound traffic, right. but paid no attention to outbound traffic. And it was critical because outbound traffic is what steals your data. I mean, right. if you are on a, somebody's hard disk, the worst thing you can do is trash your hard disk. But if you can communicate to the outside, you can steal the secrets, which is far, far more devastating. And so we blocked all of this. We verified each application. We put a very, very solid uh, uh, protection, self-protection mechanism in there. So it was very hard to knock us off the machine once we were installed. And Steve was skeptical, as he should be. And He's so we, skeptical of everything. Yeah, new. I know. <laughs> and no, so, he doesn't like it. And so we invited him into the office, and I actually t uh, set him down on a, a computer and says, "Here's our source code. I mean, he's a programmer. He he can read the code, and you can look at anything. If you have any questions, uh, try it out. Figure out. Tell me where our weaknesses are." And he spent a considerable amount of time uh, in our office, never gotten paid for it. It was it was just really uh, uh, his interest and. After he'd done a really, really thorough research, who we are, what we're doing, he said, N you know what? These guys know what they're doing, and they're, they're honest guys, and they're good guys, and uh, uh, essentially endorsed us. And that was really a big step in, in the development of uh, Zone Labs and, and Zone Alarm. Steve, so, so how did Steve find you? Did, he, uh, did you contact Steve Gibson, or how did that I happen? I think I actually ended up contacting him because yeah. we're kind of working on the same problem from two different edges. Right. So he was, he was doing Shields Up, which yeah. was really showing the vulnerability and demonstrating the vulnerability, while we working at the same time on a solution, how to do that and to, to, complicate it, it, yeah. to mitigate it. And the complicated part is to mitigate it in a way that you don't have to be... A, uh, a technologist, and they did not have to understand all right. these things. So that was really the the breakthrough: is everybody understands there's an application running, everybody understands an application is communicating, and to ask somebody, hey, do you know that this is happening on your computer? <laughs> is actually a really really easy way to do that. And later we ended up automatizing that, uh, creating panels of users that actually automatically figured out what's good, what's bad, so the the users didn't have to make those decisions. Um, it was free at first, wasn't it? it? Was what was the deal there? It was a freemium model, so we had a free Another version. thing you did very early. I don't yes. know if anybody I, was doing I, freemium no, back no, then. No, nobody, nobody did that. So, we, And frankly, we didn't have any money. I mean, I was broke. <laughs> the company was broke. So that's a bold and thing to say, well, we'll just give it away. We gave it away, and then we built a pro product on top. Originally, we only cared about enterprise, and the enterprises looked at us and said, no, nah, yeah. we don't have a problem. And so we <laughs> well, did they have a problem or did they? Of course they did. Yeah, they just, they didn't just acknowledge didn't it. Yeah. And 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 uh, we gave away this free product, and the free product became very very popular uh, popular amongst IT guys. And the IT guys then carried the product into the enterprise, uh, and then we had like IBM licensing it oh, wow. for three hundred thousand computers. All oh, the wow. internal computers had Zona Arm on, and as far as I know, still have it. How interesting! Yeah. So so it was free to end to non commercial users only. It or? was free. And then we had a pro product that had a lot more right. uh, bells and whistles. We ended up bundling antivirus, which still has its place, and all kinds of other protection there. We had a whole suite. And to that, be frank, that that's when it kind of started to go downhill. There was too much stuff in it at that point, right? Uh, <laughs> I think that, let me e explain it's, that to me, because it happens to every single mm -hmm. program in this space. Yeah. Norton's the most famous yeah. example, mm -hmm. where they just keep throwing stuff until it just becomes so bloated and big mm -hmm. It's unusable. 
Well, one of the problems that Norton has is they weren't particularly good developers. So this stuff was, <laughs> I think, it was at that time, anyway. 100 megabytes download yeah. slowed down like yeah. hell. And, and it was just really, was really great. We, we yeah. were very, very compact, and we didn't really impact uh, the performance. But we loved just the simple zone yeah. alarm. Mm -hmm. But when it started to get be more and more stuff, mm -hmm. then it was more and more stuff. But you still could get the simple zone alarm yeah. for free and zone alarm pro yeah. for free. The one thing that we did well when we did pro is we actually built a system that had a central database so it had essentially a database in the cloud that says is it when we see a new application so we would ask the data. database say have you heard about that I so we wouldn't that. constantly ask users right. about stuff that they uh, possibly can't answer. and you could when you had a connection to the outside world yeah. you could you could say what is this yeah and you would would call the database well and let you know. if you didn't have a connection to the outside uh, we didn't have to protect anything so right. it was, <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't really an issue but I thought that was really great because yeah. uh, a lot of times you'd have Stuff go wrong, and you wouldn't yeah. know how, you wouldn't know where to find out more about right. it. But you always were able to say you always go to Zone Alarm yeah. and say, "Tell yeah. me about what's going. Yeah. What is this connection?" Yeah. And you would know, and you'd explain it. Mm. It's a great thing. No, and it was a really, really cool piece of core technology. And when we wrote it, we didn't know what it's going to end up being. We knew it's, what we wanted to do roughly, but we had no idea that what the product going to be like. Once Microsoft's it, and this was in Service Pack Two on XP, mm. I think yeah. started to they turned on the firewall. This right. is something Stephen had been calling for for years, yeah. um, not only turned it on by default, mm. which it hadn't been, right. which was weird, but started to beef it up. It still was only uh, inbound traffic, though, I think. No, it, they, they, start started, to they started to do outbound traffic. And now, if you're on a Windows machine and install a new it software, it, 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 yeah. it, 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 it was a great... We, we actually didn't think it's a particularly good idea that Microsoft themselves get so involved in that. And Why for not? a while, they were thinking, well... It's really hard if you, on the one hand, create about 80% of vulnerabilities, which Windows <laughs> did at that time. Right. There is an inherent conflict of interest to say, well, I'm going to block that, because half of the software they should have blocked is their own software. Right. And they never really did that. So there, right. was, there was somewhat of a conflict of interest. Uh, and at that time, they thought they're going to make a really big business out of it. So it's kind of like, hey, listen, I'm going to create all this insecure software, and then I'm going to make an extra SKU to protect, to protect you against it. <laughs> and we had, a, we had a couple of uh, beefy discussions with them. Yeah. And How did uh, they feel about Zone Alarm when it first came out? In the, uh, they didn't understand it. I don't yeah. think they understood that there's a vulnerability. It took them two or three years to really understand how vulnerable they are. And, I mean, if you look, uh, big companies are still as clueless today. I mean, if you look at what happened with Lenovo and Superfish and... Right. All of that stuff. I mean, it's like they're kind of like, oh, we are intercepting traffic here. That might not be a good idea. But we didn't realize that. You should. You would think they would know. You would you think, would but think it's, they would know that. I mean, or the security company actually built the underlying technology, signing certificates with their own company name. Yeah. I mean, look. It's so wrong. <laughs> uh, I mean, what shall I say? It's like people as clueless now than they were then. I guess so. So they, so they didn't. They did. They fight you in the early days. Did they say? Well, it was. There was a funny period, and it, because there were no no APIs, there were no real good ways of building a personal firewall within Windows, and right. particularly because we're in a kernel. On Linux the driver had. Level. I, was it IP change? Linux had solutions, right? It was really nothing. In, yeah, there was some of it, but it was. It, As it you was, say, it was very manual. It was. It was. It was very manual. So yeah. we really hacked the kernel. I mean, we intercepted all kinds of and stuff. And Microsoft, I know, doesn't like that. Well, when what happened is every time there's a new version of Windows that broke Sonalarm, alarm, right. then we had about 30 million users. That means they actually had to then make sure that they don't break us anymore right. and to the point that they kept all kinds of really weird things in there so, so <laughs> we would continue to run. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's basically... When they went to beta, zone alarms broken. By the time they shipped, they fixed it. That's kind of the story of Windows all along. Was this all of this purpose-built code, yeah. program by yeah. program, all yeah. these lines of code to say, "Oh, we can't break that. Yeah. We can't break that. We can't break that. We can't break." That. I had a, a long discussion with Brad Silverberg, who used to be my boss at Borland, and then actually ran Windows division right. at uh, at Microsoft. And he said, there's so much code in Windows oh. that they have not the faintest idea what it's for, what it uh, was done for, and stuff like that. And they don't dare to remove it because it's kind of like, yeah, it's there. Nobody already. documented it. Nobody, Nobody said, documented this is what we're it. Doing. It was just one customer somewhere needed something. I, I, I hope it's better now. I have no idea. You have, you have to have some sympathy for the challenge that they oh, face. Oh, yeah, too, absolutely. And they had, one, they had one strategic disadvantage over Apple. Apple changed their CPUs, I think, three times. Yeah. And every time they changed the CPUs, they threw out everything and rewrote the kernel over. and started over. 
And so a lot of that low-level stuff that right. was on Apple was relatively new code. They never had a trouble yeah. cutting off legacy yeah. software. But they didn't have the enterprise customers that right. uh, are very, very slow upgrading to right. new versions. I mean, uh, if you look today, there's probably 90% or 80%, I don't have the exact numbers, of the enterprises are still on Windows XP? 7. <laughs> well, More I than half XP. still XP. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's scary. That's really scary. Yeah, I know. But it was in the, finally, Windows XP Service Pack 2 where Microsoft mm -hmm. seemed to sit up and say, oh, we've got a problem here. Right. We've got to start paying attention. Mm -hmm. And um, I think over time, by patching and patching and updating and updating, mm -hmm. you know, Steve still uses XP. Yeah. They kind of, they, they made it pretty solid. Right. No, it's it's a lot it's a lot more solid today. And but what also happened is that the attack vectors changed. Yeah. So in the beginning, it was the operating system itself, and it was the browsers. Now you have every single application. It's reader. It's, it's Flash. Uh, it's Java. I mean, yeah, again, it's one stupid bundled thing yeah. on a Lenovo computer yeah. completely wipes out any protection that you had with SSL, wipes out, uh, creates a man-in-the-middle attack, and basically wipes out five years of progress in security just because somebody didn't really pay attention. That is kind of, when you say it that way, it's pretty dramatic. <laughs> it's pretty dramatic. It is very dramatic. Yeah. I mean, look, these guys sell millions and millions of these things, and it... it because the certificate is so purely, the, the whole technology is not only, I mean, the technology itself is evil. The whole thing, idea of playing ads in your SSL stream uh, where they have no business of doing is evil. But uh, then the way they implemented it was completely brain dead. Do you blame Snapfish? I mean, Superfish? Do you blame the company Superfish? They blamed, both Lenovo and Superfish blamed Commodia. Well, it's really a three layer of stupidity. <laughs> uh, it's, it's Komodia did something that absolutely shouldn't be allowed to they do. And that's, by, a, by that's, the way, that's hacking. Yeah, one that's of the pure that's, hacking. Yeah, and, and, and really in a, in a way that you really shouldn't be doing this. Right. Uh, Self signed certificates, man in the middle. And and not having a man in the middle. Same and, password on and everything. Everything that we did in the last five years to prevent this kind of attacks, it, it was kind of basically. Uh, uh, I mean, out. five years ago, we had uh, man-in-middle attacks, and they fixed the SSL right. layers, they fixed the browsers, the browsers get constantly updated, and suddenly this thing, they put a certificate on the machine that's purely purely designed, that basically, and they don't pay attention to any of these, uh, all these things. It, it does raise the interesting issue that sophisticated users, most of the people watching our shows mm. are sophisticated. Mm. They will not only know about the story, they'll understand the man in the middle, they'll understand the self-signed certificate, they'll be able to look at the certificate. You know, if you go to a secure site mm. and the certificate on your secure site is coming from Superfish, mm. you kind of know, wait a minute, that's not Bank of America, that's mm. not Amazon. So our audience knows, and this is the same thing that probably happened with Zone Alarm. The sophisticated users understood what Zone Alarm did, wanted it to do what it does, but then there's a the vast majority of users, mm. and and they shouldn't need to know, but they don't know, they don't care, and they're the ones who were really bit by this. And frankly, they're the ones who said, I'm not going to put Zone Alarm there. It keeps bothering me mm. about stuff. I don't want to know. Well, we we gotten we gotten rid of a lot of the bothering part. And in, made, early on, made, it did warn you in, a in, lot. In, 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 early on, we did. And then later on, we kind of like got rid of that better. because yeah. for, for exactly that reason, because people can't make this decision. How do you protect users against themselves? It's a tough challenge. Well, the first one is you don't get in their way. I mean, there's there's all kinds of there's all kinds of interesting uh, analogies about how security works, and the number one rule is the moment security becomes too inconvenient, people will find ways around it. Right. I mean, there's. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, but that's always the trade-off. Steve's always talking about the trade-off between convenience mm. and security. Yeah. And for true security, it might be a little bit inconvenient. Two-factor authentication can be a pain in the ass, but. It works. It works, and there are ways of making convenient. And one of the things that the security industry in general has done a poor job is to actually make not get in the way and make uh, and 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 frankly, also communicating better and saying, "Hey, listen, these are serious issues." Yeah. I mean, if you think the consumer PCs are bad, look at small business websites. I mean, <laughs> the typical small business, the go to daddy site, is they hired some guy. Uh, who build their website, they put WordPress on it, they put some kind of plugin for WordPress on it, and, and then the guy started, 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 uh, started driving Uber and has no more interest in that. <laughs> and, then, and then three years later, they end up on the Google blacklist. Right. And they, it, it's not even a challenge to break into these sites. And what it does, it, it creates really a black hat infrastructure right. where these guys can now have direct accessible servers, they can 
deposit their stuff and so on. And, and it's, nobody writes about it. And well, we about talk it. about it a lot. And uh, you didn't know that Steve still does a show. It's called yeah. Security yeah. Now. And okay. that's all we talk about. In fact, I can't wait till Wednesday when mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get Steve's opinion on this Superfish okay. uh, issue. Mm -hmm. But that's he's talking mm -hmm. about that all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah, one of the important things, by the way, it's not just Superfish. Komodo licensed the same technology to about 100 companies yeah. from nanny monitors to God knows what. Yeah. And so that certificate it's and that over. technology is all over the place. Yeah, Ars Technica, Dan Gooden on Ars Technica has yeah. done a good job of summarizing mm. uh, the, where Komodo, Komodia is, why it's an issue. If you, if you haven't read his articles, mm. uh, do read them. And I know Wednesday mm. uh, you're going to want to be here. I'll, I'll walk in. <laughs> <laughs> 1 p.m. Pacific, yeah. 4 p.m. Eastern. And we yeah. will be covering that with uh, Steve, I have no doubt at all. We're talking to Greg Royer uh, Frund, who has an amazing story. Uh, started in the early days of Borland with Turbo Pascal, brought it to uh, Germany. Um, created Zone Labs, uh, the first really uh, successful uh, firewall product, one we recommended. In, uh, you were on the screensaver yeah. talking about it, one we recommended for years, um, and uh, has a new company, Versal. We'll talk mm -hmm. about uh, education. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great area for you to get into. It was an interesting area, particularly because I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> You're a high school dropout. Yeah, I'm a high school dropout. Uh, I... Sold Zone Labs to an Israeli company, Checkpoint. Worked, That's right, Checkpoint bought yeah, yeah. it. When did Checkpoint buy it? Uh, trying to figure out the year. It's, it's a while ago. Yeah, it's uh, six, seven years ago, something right. like that. Well, we're going to find out what you've yeah. been doing in those six years. Hold on a All second, right. okay? Gregor Freund is our guest as we continue on triangulation. And get your questions ready if you're in the chat room watching live, because mm -hmm. we'll give you a chance to uh, ask questions as well. Mm -hmm. We talk about education a lot because we talk about lynda.com. I guess what we're in is education. We mm -hmm. like to teach people. Mm -hmm. But Linda does it like this is this is serious stuff. Linda Wyman, another uh, great screensavers guest many times. Uh, she was uh, wrote some of the best books on web development and has now expanded into videos. Linda.com over the intervening 10 years has really grown now 4,500 courses, not just web development, but photography visual design, business, business, soft business skills, like negotiating, resume building, software training, like Excel, like WordPress, like Photoshop, all of the courses taught by experts. I mean, when you're learning Photoshop from Burt Monroy, there is no question you are learning from an expert. So whether you're looking for more, more by the way, not just experts, but great teachers, that, that's kind of important. They go together. Uh, and more courses uh, added every week. If you want to improve your job skills so you can get a better job or ask the boss for a, a, a promotion and a raise, if you want to explore a new hobby, it's great for that. I, I, you, know, you know photography is my hobby. I learned so much about Lightroom and Photoshop and photography in general from some of my favorite photographers at lynda.com. They've got something for everyone. Uh, influencing Others is a great course. Branding Fundamentals. This is something you're going to really, if you're a business, you need to learn. I, I mentioned Burt Monroy. His Pixel Playground series is incredible. Programming for non-programmers, iOS 8. They teach you how to build an iOS app with absolutely no programming experience. I've been studying Swift on lynda.com, Apple's new programming language. It is just fantastic. Invest in yourself. Sign up for a free 10-day, yeah, it's now 10-day trial to lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A, lynda.com slash triangulation to get that 10-day trial. You'll not only get unlimited access to every course, including access on iOS and Android devices, but new courses as they're added every week. lynda.com slash triangulation to try it absolutely free for 10 days. Invest in yourself at lynda.com. You're watching Triangulation. Our guest, uh, Gregor Freund, GP Freund on uh, Twitter. Do you yes. tweet? Uh, more now than ever, but yes. Uh, you tweet about Versal? I tweet about Versal occasionally, yeah. What is Versal? Versal is an online platform where anybody can create online courses and publish them. So to give you a little bit of a background, I sold Zone Labs. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had finally, in the first time in my life, really, a little bit of time at my hands. You can just retire. Relax. I, uh, I, sail, I actually, sail. That's what Philippe did. He went sailing. Oh, <laughs> Philippe works probably harder than anybody else. Uh, but I've been, I, he does when he's sailing too. I've seen he, him yeah, sailing on the bay. I mean, it's like I don't he's think hardcore. he's ever. I don't think he's ever out of reach. <laughs> and no, I love what I'm doing. This is not for me. It's not a chore. I love yeah. building technology. And but I kind of like was essentially thinking about what's the next 
cool thing to do. Right. And I took some online classes. Oh, that's neat. And I was actually really frustrated because a lot of these online classes, and by the way, Linda is a big exception because as I'm, they have really amazing Thank video Thank you for courses. saying that. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not. They do a great job. They yeah. really do a great job. Yeah. But, but you're but, right, uh, not to name names, but there are a lot of places where it can be very frustrating to, to learn. And, and a lot of the online education comes from Harvard, from right. Stanford and things like that, and they really kind of make the courses for themselves. It's basically their college course yeah. recorded, which it's, is great that they're giving that away, like mm -hmm. the uh, Open Courseware right. Initiative. That's great, yeah. but it's not. Mm -hmm. it, you're right. It's not interactive. It's not interactive. It's uh, you can't play with that. And frankly, right. it's it's filmed lectures. And for me, look, there's a reason why I dropped out of school. I, if you put me uh, in a lecture for an hour and a half, I doze off after five minutes. Yeah. And they're building these courses for people who, ha who actually go to Stanford, go to Harvard, who have perfect recall, perfect notes, and actually can sit there for an hour and a half and actually take something away from that. It doesn't work for me. Yeah. And I would suspect it doesn't work for most people. So we then started looking, hey, why is, are these courses not any better? Why are they not interactive? Why can't play? And I had, I had this experience when I was a kid in Germany. We went, uh, the whole class went to the Deutsche Museum in Munich, which is a very, very cool technical museum, very much hands-on. And they had a big, in the middle of the museum, a big metal cage. And they put a guy in the middle of the cage <laughs> and then had, we had a console in front of it. We could press a button and every time we press a button, there would be a big flashes on the guy and the guy didn't die, which was kind of cool. <laughs> And you remember it, don't I, you? I, well, I remember that. Yeah. I also remember the principle that you have a metal cage, the electricity stays at the perimeter, it's called a Faraday cage. And I never got this repeated afterwards. I remember that from then. And Isn't the only reason why I remember it is because yeah. I actually got to press a button. Yeah. And that really taught me one thing, that if you want to learn something, you have to participate in that. And they knew that 30, 40 years ago, and then fast forward into online education, into all these MOOCs, they completely forgot that lesson. MOOCs. MOOCs, yeah. Ma Massively online. online uh, you probably get it better something to, together. Something open, uh, I don't know. Massive online, uh, something. They're, so, something massive online <laughs> courses. <laughs> MOOCs yep. is what they yep. call yep. them, and there are quite a few of them. Yeah. Uh, Khan Academy is very famous, but there's a lot well, of Khan these Academy is a little different. I, mean, I would put them in a somewhat different category. Because yeah, you I just mean, go and you watch the videos. Does, yeah, MOOCs, you actually part, yeah, you sign yeah, up, yeah, you yeah, take the class. Yeah. yeah, but that just didn't work for me. These are, it, this is not a MOOC. No, no, not at all. So uh, what we what we wanted, what we looked at is why are these courses so bad? Yeah. And then we discovered it's very very expensive to produce good ones because a couple of good ones, and there are good courses out there. They have to actually uh, hire a bunch of JavaScript developers right. who build them the courses, which is prohibitively expensive, particularly if you go into more uh, peripheral areas. So we said, okay, we build a better platform to build these courses. So we don't publish courses. I mean, we have a bunch of sample courses on the website, but the core is that we actually anybody can create their own courses. And we invented this whole idea of a learning gadget. A learning gadget can be a standard thing, can be a video, can be text, can be all of these things. But a learning gadget can be a three-dimensional model that you play around with. It can be a timeline. It can be uh, what we call deeper diagram, a way of discovering in a graphic and clicking on things and kind of finding more layers, almost like a game. And you can create all of these things without any kind of programming. I'm playing it right now. I'm oh, learning cool. about B-Boy. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, oh, here we go. Now, they, so this is, so you choose a style of dance, a style of study, rather. Scatter, learn, test, flashcards, space race, speller. So these are different ways that people like to learn. Well, there are all kinds of learning gadgets in the... Uh, in, uh, in there. So it's an open platform. You have, I think you have now 60 different ones. And again, they reach from very, very simple ones to very complicated ones. And uh, <laughs> what you're looking at right now is actually a, qu a Quizlet, which is... It's a, fun! Which, it's, it, which is a third party, which is a company that makes these really quizzes. But oh, we now can So you embed it into we the can, course. We can embed existing videos, we can embed uh, Prezi's, we can embed uh, SketchUp, uh, SoundCloud, videos, here, SoundCloud and so on. So, so you use tools that are existing tools. We have our own and we use existing ones and a teacher or a professor or an instructor can actually 
look, the teacher comes to the classroom today and they come with a bucket of stuff. Right. So they said, oh, well, here's all the things you should look at. Right. But there's really no learning experience behind that because it's not coordinated, it's not in a specific order and things like that. So what we allow them is to take all of the things that they already have and some of them they might create on Versal and put them in a linear uh, orthogonal form. So do this first, watch that video, do a quiz, right. then do this Quizlet, then watch that Prezio, then do another quiz and so on. So it allows them really to uh, curate a lot of this content in addition to creating their own content. So uh, do you need to be a learning specialist to do this? No, I mean, this B-Boy uh, course was created by an intern yeah. of yours. Yeah. No, no, we, we have, uh, we're signing up about 500 teachers a day right How now. How do you help them create a useful course? Do you well, in a lot of cases, they already do that. They, they have the materials, They have sure. the materials, and for them, the challenge is really that their students live in this electronic world. They live on uh, iPads, they live on iPhones and things right. like that, and they are still on a whiteboard and with books. And so one of, the, one of the really interesting things about what we're doing is we're actually enabling teachers to suddenly speak the same language as a student is. They are now cool. They actually can publish stuff online and the students can actually get these uh, courses online. Is this free? It's free uh, for basic use. So it's like the YouTube model. You yeah. can create your courses. You can publish them. And if you want to track your learners, you want to get results from the learners, uh, you pay a fairly moderate fee. I think it's fifty dollars a year. Fifty dollars a year yeah, for for so a teacher. So a school, uh, a teacher could use yeah. this. And then we have we have uh, uh, licensing for large organizations uh, or school districts and so on that then can basically have a license for everybody else. As a learner, I can come here and take these are some, there's some some courses here already. Yes, but that's really as a learner you can take the sample courses we have on but the these website. These are more to demonstrate. Yeah, they demonstrate what we're yeah. doing. It's really for teachers, uh, for uh, corporate trainers. Uh, we have customer I give you one example. Uh, for example, the Cherokee Nation has all the history courses on Russell because it allows them without programmers, without anything like that, in a very, very rich, interesting way to tell the history of the Cherokee, to tell the history of the Tea of tra uh, 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 Trail of Tears yeah. and uh, all of that stuff. And they don't have to go to an instructional designer. They don't have to do any of that stuff. They can do it themselves. So, so this is really the promise of technology is for somebody to make a tool yeah. that is easy enough for another person to use to create something yeah. of value to a third yeah. One, one, one frustration about online learning, particularly from a teacher's perspective, is if you get these courses, maybe your school district bought some courses that you can use in the classroom and things like that, they are not malleable. They are very, very strict. This is a course, that's it. Yeah. But if I'm here in, you're here in Marin County, uh, if I'm here, I, I want to have a local reference in there. Right. I don't want to just show all the things that happen somewhere else. If I want to do a biology course, I want to talk about the local ferns, about the local fauna, and right. not just about all the stuff that happens somewhere else. And the teachers are cut off uh, that. Because so they're what, using canned materials yeah, yeah, that are... Exactly. Yeah. And so what the model that we actually promote and that seems to work really, really well is they can take canned content and mix it up with their own stuff, mix it yeah. up with stuff they find online, and create still an orthogonal, straight learning experience and then press one button and the student has it on their iPad, has it on their iPhone. And then the other thing is a lot of schools have what's called LMSs, learning management systems. So we integrate with those. So they can basically monitor what the students are doing and integrate the whole experience in, in one uh, form. So if you have Schoology or if you have Canvas or if you have uh, Blackboard and many other ones, we just tightly integrate with all of those. Uh, we work perfectly well standalone but we all do work with existing infrastructure. And the courses are always hosted on Versal? They're always hosted on Versal. It's a software as a service. Yeah. Uh, and it's just the only way to do that. It's so beautiful. I have Thank to you say, very it's much. very elegant. It's very kind. Very modern yeah. uh, web design. Yeah. Well, one of the things is we don't allow a lot of layout options. And the reason why we don't, uh, we want to avoid them. For it's like, kind of like medium. Same idea, yeah. right? Keep it clean. Well, it's Don't also junk it up. it's also if if I allow you columns and all of this other stuff, right. it doesn't work very well on mobile devices. Right, and true. you can create the courses. We don't want to have a MySpace experience. We want to have a really yeah, yeah. clean, straightforward experience. It couldn't be more clean and straightforward. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's really it's beautiful. Kind. I mean, our designers are going to be very pleased to hear. Yeah. That. What? And so, tell me a little bit about how this, what this is uh, running on. 
it's, it's technology. It's a very, very com. I mean, because it's so simple, the technology in the back end tends to be very, very complicated. There's a whole <laughs> massive. Isn't it always yeah, that way, right? The simpler yes, the pre yeah. simpler yeah. the presentation, the more complicated. Yeah, yeah. yeah the there's scenes. a massive back end uh, that monitors the teacher. So, for example, you can uh, monitor the learner. So, for example, you can start a course today on your home computer, then do another lesson in the car and finish it over lunch in, in, in your office computer. It always knows where you are. It up, automatically updates where you are. And uh, it's, it's a really very clean uh, and environment. And the most important thing is really anybody can create this. It's not just the experts and the instructional designers. It's, we see that in, in a lot of companies now starting to do that because they don't want to wait for the instructional designers to come up with something and stuff like that. It, they, stuff moves so quickly. I want to create a course real quickly yeah. and just put it out there. Do you imagine yourself also to be a, a, a destination for people who want to learn things? Are you going to start, or is the, these are just demos right now? These this are is, demos right now. We, we kind of go back and forth on that. For the time being, I think we are much better off focusing on creating stuff and right. allowing people to publish it. Everything we build, by the way, can be embedded. So you can take a course on Versal and embed it in your own website. Neat. And so yeah. if you have a WordPress uh, uh, site or any of that stuff, it's really easy to just take it. You, there's a publishing panel. You create the embed code and just move it right in the middle of, of your own environment. Or, for example, move it behind your paywall if you want to get paid. That's nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're talking to Gregor Freund. This is his new company, Versal. We'll have some uh, final thoughts and your questions, too, in uh, just a little bit. Our show today brought to you by FreshBooks. The, uh, now, this is an example of where a great web design could change my life. This was the first, I think, and I don't know if they still call it Web 2.0, but this was the first Web 2.0 site I'd ever used. And now I'm talking 10 years ago. Uh, I was doing going to Canada to do the TV show, and every month I had a Bill Rogers not only for my day rate, but also for expenses, the plane ticket, the hotel, and all of that stuff. And frankly, it was such a pain in the butt to fire up Microsoft Word, to put in the stuff, to print it out, to mail it to them. I often put it off. I wouldn't do it for months at a time. And Frank, it was getting to be an issue with, with Rogers, with my, with my clients, not just Rogers, I had other clients. It was getting to be an issue. Uh, Amber was the one who told me about FreshBooks. They had just started in uh, Toronto in 2004. And when I found this, it changed my life. First of all, I was, it was easy to create professional-looking invoices, easy to deliver them. They, they, they will stamp and mail them, but, but email is, nowadays is the way to do it. And the nice thing about the email invoice, there can be a button in it that says, pay me. And FreshBooks supports all the mobile payment services, all the top credit cards, uh, online payment systems, Stripe, Fundbox. They also support Google Apps and PayPal and MailChimp and Zen Payroll. I mean, they really integrate well. And that means you get paid faster because it turns out, I didn't know this, your clients actually want to pay you. In most cases, they just they, they just make it easy for them. They will pay you. That's why on average, FreshBooks customers get paid five days faster. And by the way, double their revenue on average in the first two, 24 months. Uh, it And for the few times when a client doesn't pay you, automatic Payment reminders take all the embarrassment out of that phone call or that email or that letter. It has never been easier to bill clients. And if you do time and hours, even better. Open the FreshBooks app on your phone, start the timer, go. It automatically goes right into the invoice. Same thing with expenses. You could take the pictures of the receipts right from your phone, enter the details in FreshBooks, boom, it's done. This will change your life. If you're sending out invoices, if you're a freelancer or a small business, you're going to love this, and you can instantly access complete financial reports. That makes it easier for you to make smart decisions about your business, and come tax time, your accountant will love you. If you ever need help, you can talk to a real person anytime. FreshBooks award-winning support is ready to help, and support is free forever. I want you to try this. They actually have a no-obligation offer, 30 days free, if you go to freshbooks.com slash triangulation. Freshbooks.com slash triangulation. Do use the word triangulation in the uh, how did you hear about us section uh, so we get credit i would appreciate that freshbooks.com slash triangulation awesome awesome so what do you guys in the chat room think of versal is this going to be a useful uh, tool for you especially if you're a teacher 
or uh, or you have a I think in a business there's a lot of education involved. We, have, we are training we people all of, the time. We have a lot of businesses, and one of the cool things is there's these learning gadgets that you're looking at. There's an open platform behind that, so you can build your own. So oh. if there's something in there that you don't want to uh, that we don't have, we have companies doing product demos in there that they can just put the right they in can there. Embed it. Yeah, for example, there's a company called Neo4j that embeds a whole graph database into a virtual course, so you don't have to switch back and forth between the course and the terminal. That's very cool. Yeah, it's really it's really amazing. So this was just something you thought, I think this is an area I can do something in, or did somebody come to you? Or? Well, uh, and a lot of times educa in education, educators are building really, really good content, but they're not technologists. I agree. Yeah. So our idea was, hey, listen, what can we as technologists and right. as people who know how to build websites, how can we, and what, how can we yeah. build something that actually makes a difference for them? And... Uh, that's why we really don't deal that much with content and we deal much, much more with, right. hey, how can we enable other people They're to out do there. that? They have the yeah, content. They have the content. They know how to teach. That's yeah. not me. But I know how to build really cool products and clean products and pro products that actually work for end users. I agree. This is gorgeous. Thank My you. dad's a professor and uh, he's retired now, but he did a course on Darwin. Mm -hmm. He used to do a course on Darwin's The Voyage of the Beagle. Right. And this was back when HyperCard was right. big. And he made a HyperCard stack mm -hmm. that was I kind of like this, interactive, fun, great. You can embed stuff in there. Mm -hmm. And then HyperCard disappeared. And he's, mm -hmm. you know, he still, I still have the HyperCard stack, but I can't use it anymore. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, there have been, this is in a way like a modern web-based hypercard. Yeah. We actually maybe should be uh, write a gadget to actually revive hypercard. Would you import hypercard? hypercard? We should be able to do that, yeah. It would be huge. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Because it's a great stack. Yeah. I mean, it has wonderful stuff mm -hmm. in it. Yeah. Um, and it's similar to this because hypercard allowed, allowed you with the uh, X commands to embed, mm -hmm. you know, audio and video right. and stuff like this. Very similar Yeah, that's, it's way. very, very similar. And yeah. it, it should really not be that much. Again, it's a completely open platform. So you can add your that's own great. components if you want to write one of those. There's a documented API. Uh, and you can just build one of these little icons down there and then just drag it in your course. For example, we did a demonstration for a computer museum that wanted to do a course of uh, uh, video games in the 80s. Yeah. And so we said, you know what, screenshots are boring. So we actually play the game. We played the game. So we oh, actually so cool. uh, collected four games, and then you had to pass Super Mario Level One in order <laughs> to get to the next lesson. I love it. I have to say, I know you're not in intending to be a compendium of great courses, mm -hmm. but just in the uh, in the learn section mm -hmm. at the Versal website, there are a lot of there's, really there's nice. Very, we have we have a couple of really cool, smart instructional designers who put their heart in, into some of that, and some of them come from the outside, and it's all free. So You need to eat your own dog food, right? You need we, to well, have... Well, you have to if, try it. And there's yeah. a complete SAT course, so if your kids are uh, about to take the SATs nice. as, as well, as a full ACT course, again, it's all... I see Chris White's got every ACT subject on here. Yeah, well, he did... He, he did uh, he's this a is really cool. very, very good instructor. But that's really not... I mean, what we're really focusing on is enabling other people to do the same yeah. thing. But it really helps if you if you see what Once can be done. Once you see it, it can yeah. inspire yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, and and it's nice to see the variety of mm. stuff yeah. as well. I mean, everything from b-boys to uh, SATs to yeah. um, learning how to read sheet music. Yeah. And, California's and driver's ed. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah. This is great. And it's it's again it's 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 free if you uh, you need if you're between 16 and 18 in California you have to actually pass a course yeah in order to actually be admitted to uh, to uh, in order to actually get your learner's license yeah and uh, we we just, I wish I'd had this when uh, my son was getting his learner's license and, and again it's it's free <sighs> and we actually had to become a driver school officially we are now in so a this is this is the this is the court you could actually this would count yeah oh yeah. <gasps> you, you, you account at the end, yeah, I think you have to pay $8 or $10 to get the certificate <laughs> because that's the fee we paid to the DMV. That's, but that's awesome. It. it was just to try out uh, to try out what, uh, and it's based on, on the official California DMV curriculum. Wow. Gregor, you, you have such a, you've had such a great career and done so much uh, for all of us. And, uh, it's really I been a pleasure. had amazing teams. I, I got to say, uh, it, it's, it's easy. Is that your real skill is finding and bringing together teams? Well, and... finding people who are a lot smarter than I am is my, my it's main skill. It's a good skill to have. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of I just sit there and watch them. You must motivate them somehow. I must motivate them. Do you do more than buy pizza? I, well, and <laughs> once in a while, when they when I get really frustrated, I start coding again, and then they say, no, don't code. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll fix it. But you like it. It's fun. Coding's fun. Yeah, I love it.
It's wonderful. Yeah, I actually. It's, you it's don't just, write in Pascal anymore. Though. No, no. I'm, I'm, I, I actually, the last three or four days spent on, uh, there was one component I wanted to get done and I didn't have to, we didn't have the resources. We didn't have. You're doing it in JavaScript? Or? Uh, that's Java and uh, Java. On, the, on the back end and uh, JavaScript on the front end. Cool. So this is uh, a Java back end? Well, it's a Scala back end. Which Scala, is, okay. Which is kind of a language that sits yeah, on yeah. top of the Java engine. Yeah. And with. That's pretty uh, sophisticated. Yeah. It's. It's very, very sophisticated yeah. stuff, yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a real pleasure meeting you. Thank you for coming by. I Thank appreciate you. it. Appreciate it. Good luck with Versal. Thank you. Thanks for Turbo Pascal. Changed my life. I, I had very little to do. <laughs> I sold it. It changed my life, too. Uh, it was amazing. Yeah. Amazing stuff. But you should thank Philippe for that. Yeah. Well, I'll thank you for Zone Alarm. How about that? Because that also changed that, my I life. I wrote most of that. That did a lot. You wrote most of the zone, original yeah. code? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. In what C? That was no C++? Uh, That was I wrote most of the drivers. It was C plus plus, and then the back end was a lot of assembly. Okay, so I respect because that's pretty low level. Oh yeah, hardcore stuff. I love assembler. <laughs> you and Steve Gibson yeah. are the last two people writing assembler. That's correct. <laughs> well, if you want to understand what's really going on, you have to. Yeah. And you know they still do the segmented architecture, don't they? On the eighty eighty six, they still they don't have a flat memory. I, I model. haven't written assembler in five years, so I'm. Uh, you have to ask Steve that, but I, I assume that the architecture is just as messed up as it's it just was ten as years ago. Funky as it ever was, because they can't change it, right? It, it, not, right. it would break everything. <laughs> oh, Intel, Intel, Intel! They tried. Remember, they tried. They they really yeah, did want to change everything, get away from x eighty six, and at they the end with all the high level languages. But it drives matter. it drives me crazy if I don't if I can't mentally translate something into assembler. Wow. I, I don't I don't want to write wow. it because if I don't know what the computer does, it it becomes really really frustrating. So you and that's why so much stuff is so inefficient. You should have gotten into sixty eight thousand assembler. Beautiful <laughs> flat memory model, elegant. Uh, you know. Well, I started out with C eighty, which was a lot more challenging than this. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Anything's better than that. Yeah. <laughs> Great to meet you. Thank you for coming by. I hey, thank it. you so much. Really for fun to talk. I appreciate it. Our uh, show uh, is every Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific. Always great people. We've got a bunch of really interesting guests uh, coming up in the next few weeks. This is so much fun. If you can, come by and join us live, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that's uh, 1900 UTC if you uh, want to watch live at twit.tv. If not, on-demand audio and video is always available uh, at our website, twit.tv slash TRI. For the moment, still on YouTube, youtube.com slash triangulation. Uh, and, of course, you can subscribe, and I, that's really probably the best thing to do. That way you'll always have the, uh, the latest uh, episode when it comes out. And you can do that on iTunes. You can do it on the podcast client on your favorite uh, mobile device. There are even wonderful Twit apps, none of which we have anything to do with. They're written by the great uh, Twit fans uh, in the audience who said, you know, you really ought to have an app for this platform. So we've got iOS, we've got Android, we've got Windows Phone, we've got Roku. Thank you uh, to all of those guys for doing that. Pick up one, and that way you'll never miss an episode. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Triangulation. Bye-bye.